Hi, my name is Emily Nix, and I am a professor of finance and business economics at the Marshall School of Business at the University of Southern California. For many, second only to fears about the spread of COVID-19 are fears about the economy and especially the possibility of unemployment. Folks around the country have either lost their jobs, are worried they will lose their jobs, or are making difficult decisions about whether and how they can keep their employees on payroll. In this talk, I will provide you with a current snapshot of where we are in terms of job loss due to the pandemic. Not only will I give you the headline numbers, I will also provide some additional context based on current research, including my own, about who has been most affected and what the long-term outcomes are most likely to be. Let's start with an overview of where we are now. Governors across the country have mandated that non-essential businesses close down and people stay at home to prevent the spread of the virus. This has predictably led to mass layoffs and furloughs, as many businesses that are no longer bringing money in can no longer afford to keep their employees on payroll. This graphic that is mapping unemployment claims from 1968 until today demonstrates that the recent surges in layoffs is unlike anything we have seen in most of our lifetimes. As you can see in the graphic, the suddenness and size of the recent layoffs far exceed even what we saw in the first few weeks of the most recent recession. According to the U.S. Department of Labor, over 25 million Americans have already filed for unemployment as a result of the pandemic. We expect these numbers to increase at least until the economy reopens especially given that a number of states currently have a backlog of insurance claims as they try to keep up with the onslaught. The labor market has been particularly bad in USC's home city of Los Angeles, where USC estimates suggest that only 45% of workers are still employed. These are shocking numbers, and they represent extraordinary strain on families here in our very own city and across the country. If we dig down deeper into these headline numbers, we see that job loss is particularly concentrated among certain groups. Women, low-income Americans, and people of color have been especially hard hit. Early March data from the Department of Labor suggests that unemployment increases were 25% higher for women compared to men. Moreover, among women working from home, past research on the child penalty, including my own work, would seem to suggest that women are far more likely to sacrifice more of their working time at home to care for children who must now be at home as schools and daycares have closed. This gender inequality and the sacrifice of working hours could also have long-term implications for the gender income gap. Additionally, Black, Hispanic, and Asian men all saw much larger increases in unemployment for the month of March compared to white men. These initial results suggest that COVID-19 could cause existing income disparities to widen. When it comes to low-income Americans, according to a very recent survey of workers across the United States, while overall 11.6% of those surveyed report losing their jobs as a result of COVID-19, as you can see in the figure on the slide, those who make less have a much harder hit. For example, the graph shows that amongst those who make less than $30,000 per year, over 10% have lost their jobs. In contrast, the rate of job loss is almost half for those who make more than $70,000 per year, with just over 5% reporting losing their jobs. This is where we are now. The economy is experiencing unprecedented levels of unemployment claims and massive job loss. So what will happen to the millions of Americans who, through no fault of their own, suddenly find themselves without a job? Unfortunately, existing research is not very reassuring. What we find is that those who are laid off experience what we have come to call an unemployment scar. What I mean by this is two things. First, individuals who are laid off are more likely to be laid off again in the future. Second, those who are laid off have lower earnings long-term. Let's get into some numbers. Consider a worker who is currently employed and enjoying gradual wage growth over time. Suddenly, all the workers in his firm are laid off. 
Research shows that such a worker will not only experience a layoff right away, but is more likely to be laid off again in the future. Moreover, compared to a similar individual who was not laid off, he will experience a drop in future earnings over the next 20 years of 21%. Roughly 40% of this loss in earnings is due to the fact that this individual is likely to be laid off again, even after he is rehired. Thus, a layoff, which unlike getting fired, generally has little to do with this specific worker's abilities or actions, still has long-term negative consequences on the worker's career. In my own research, we find that there is also stark inequality in the impacts of job loss. We show that those who are laid off, whose parents are wealthier, in particular, whose parents are in the top 10% in terms of the income distribution, bounce back much faster than those whose parents were in the bottom 10% of the income distribution. To summarize, children of wealthier parents find new jobs more quickly and see their salaries bounce back faster. Thus, the current layoffs we have seen as a result of COVID-19 could lead to increases in inequality for two reasons. As I discussed before, a larger percent of low-income Americans have lost their jobs. Additionally, my own research suggests that the unemployment scar is deeper and longer for lower-income individuals. There is yet another effect of layoffs that is even worse than the unemployment scar. An article in the Quarterly Journal of Economics showed that high seniority men who were laid off experienced increases in mortality rates of 50 to 100 percent in the year following the job displacement. While we are all well aware of the mortality risk of COVID-19, this study suggests that layoffs can also cost lives. In addition to the effects of layoffs themselves, research shows that students who graduate during a recession are badly harmed. Given that all indicators suggest we are entering a recession if we aren't already in one, this is also cause for great concern. Studies on past recessions show over and over and over again that students who graduate from college into a recession have prolonged earnings losses compared to students who graduated just before the recession. That is to say, suppose we have two women graduating from college named Jasmine and Molly. Jasmine graduated in 2007 just before the last recession, and Molly graduated during the height of the last recession. Even if Jasmine and Molly are otherwise alike, Molly, as a result of graduating into a recession, learned less than Jasmine does for many years. Specifically, estimates suggest that Molly will earn somewhere between 1% and 20% less than Jasmine every year for at least 17 years after graduating. If you add the years of earnings losses together, this represents a huge drop in total earnings for Molly just because she was unlucky enough to graduate into a recession. I have given you the bad news about the long-term and unequal impacts of job loss, as well as the negative impacts of graduating during a recession. So what can be done? First, many of those who have recently been laid off desperately need access to unemployment benefits as soon as possible. This includes self-employed, gig workers, and independent contractors. As long as the country is still encouraging people to stay at home for public safety, we do not need to debate the incentives effects of offering generous unemployment. The very reason folks are unemployed is because we are either encouraging or requiring that they do not go to work. So until that changes, let's simply make sure that those who are laid off because of these policies can still afford their next family meal. Second, we must do everything in our power to make sure these layoffs are as short as possible. My first priority in this regard is to take every step we can to be able to safely reopen the economy as quickly as possible. As long as public safety requires people to stay at home, businesses cannot reopen, and so they cannot hire new employees or rehire their old employees. 
We will need to work hand in hand with public health officials and experts in other, other fields, but this can mean things like enforcement of wearing masks in public, better procedures to track and trace infections, investing to get a vaccine sooner, and much more. We must also promote policies that aim to prevent long-term separations between workers and their existing firms. The ability to reopen the economy is a proverbial dynamite in the government's arsenal, a tool that we have never been able to use before in past recessions. The hope is that this policy tool will carry a lot of punch if it is deployed at the right time. One way for it to have a bigger impact is if businesses are standing by and ready to re-employ their laid-off and furloughed workers. One program that intends to do just this is the Paycheck Protection Program, or PPP. This program is providing loans to small businesses that will be forgiven, provided firms meet requirements aimed at keeping workers employed or getting workers quickly rehired. If workers are only temporarily laid off, but are quickly rehired once we start the economy again, then hopefully some of the longer-term consequences of layoffs I have discussed can be avoided. All of these steps could help us avoid long-term negative consequences for those who have been laid off in these difficult times. And remember, if workers are rehired, this means that they have salaries to spend in the broader economy, which could also help the economy recover. That is to say, what helps workers who have recently been laid off, or students who are just now graduating, could in fact help us all. I hope you all continue to stay safe, and thank you for listening.